Hello, I'm Camilla Bassey. Welcome to my talk on global capital and pandemics. The outbreak of SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19 precedes an escalation of recent epidemics and proto-pandemics, notably H5N1 or avian influenza, SARS, MERS, swine flu, Ebola and Zika. We are not currently experiencing a pandemic, Mike Davis pronounces, we are living in an age of pandemics. Rob Wallace explains this trend as the consequence of interrelated changes in economic geography and ecological geographies, a widening circuit of agricultural production, consumption and exchange that is pushing deeper into forests and back out into cities with subsequent changes in the ecologies of host species that historically would have been confined to deep forests which are now transported to peri-urban regions with high concentrations of human bodies. Traversing a globally integrated air traffic network, pathogens previously not on the global stage are increasingly being brought to it. Davis, citing a study from Science magazine, illustrates the context of Ebola and other diseases emerging in and from West Africa currently the fastest urbanising area in the world. The population of West Africa has traditionally relied on fish protein. However, commencing in the 1980s, European, Russian and Japanese factory fleets have trawled and significantly reduced this biomass. Concurrently, multinational logging companies have increased their operations. To keep their costs down, they hire professional hunters to kill mammals in their path. With fish becoming too expensive for West African city dwellers, the population has turned to the consumption of bush meat, originally practiced in the logging camps, as the major source of protein. In sum, this widening commerce of bush meat hunting, alongside the destruction of rainforest, have generated new viral exposures and pathways of, to humans of previously isolated pathogens. In this presentation, using the case studies of HIV, AIDS and SARS, I explore the nexus between capitalist political economy, nature and emergent infectious diseases. Concluding that, without radical change to how we organise and run our world, our future will be locked into this trajectory of escalating pandemics. Starting then with HIV, AIDS. HIV-1 and HIV-2 originate from the simian immune deficiency viruses of chimpanzees and sooty mangabees in Central and West Africa. With the probable zoonotic leap from one chimpanzee to one human hunter of bushmeat through a cut or wound no later than 1908. From here, the virus travelled. At this moment, put in historical context, previous epidemiological dead ends were no longer so. The virus travelled because of changes in conditions of existence propelled by a capital fueled colonial age. Mark Honigsbaum points to the emergence of steamship, transportation and road and railway construction during the colonial period of the Congo and the relentless pursuit of profit by logging and timber companies intersecting with social and cultural phenomenon bushmeat hunting and consumption and prostitution by the labour camps of railway and timber companies as the central early drivers in the journey of HIV AIDS. While official Belgian colonial rule of the Congo ran from 1908 to 1960, the groundwork for colonial expansion began in the late 19th century. Given the need of capital to self-expand, Thus, the impetus for greater mobility of both capital and labour, the 1892 steamship service from Leopoldville, later renamed Kinshasa, to Stanleyville, later Kinzangi, and the 1898 Matadi Kinshasa Railway, linking the port of Matadi to Leopoldville, provided geographical connectivity and concentration of populations previously separated. With a consequent influx of labour migrants and Belgian administrators, a rapidly urbanising Leopoldville became the capital of the Belgian Congo in 1923, 
running domestic flight services, and by 1936, a direct international flight route to, to Brussels. Further geographical connectivity and concentration of capital and labour came under French colonial administration, notably the construction of the Congo Ocean Railroad in the 1920s, which, cutting through forest, brought labourers into rural territories home to the simian immune deficiency viruses. Once built, this railroad provided a constant flow of Africans and Europeans between Brazzaville, the new capital of the French colonial federation, through Leopoldville to Point Noir at the coast. What's more, road construction through the Congo Basin by timber companies pushed bushmeat hunters deeper into forests and encouraged the growth of prostitution near the labour camps. One way or another, or rather one way and another, through new viral pathways that were new transport pathways driven by capital accumulation, by the 1920s, Leopoldville was home to HIV. Both Honigsbaum and Quayman draw on research by Jack Pepin to explain how the virus amplifies from here into a, an eventual global pandemic, sex and medical technology, specifically the reuse of ineffectively sterilised hypodermic needles and reusable syringes in public and humanitarian health campaigns in Africa and blood banks and transfusion services. These were the key amplifiers of HIV. By the 1920s, Leopoldville had a large male labour force, with economic migrants discouraged by the Belgian colonial administration from bringing their families with them. Consequently, men outnumbered women four to one and prostitution was widespread. The virus likely amplified through a campaign by the Congolese Red Cross, which established a clinic in 1929 in Leopoldville to treat sexually transmitted diseases. This campaign ran throughout the 1930s and 1940s and peaked in terms of the number of administered injections in 1953. Another possible amplification was during the 1930s through the vaccination campaigns that ran along the railways against yours and sleeping sickness and also against malaria in southern Cameroon. HIV-1, Group M subtype B, around 1966 travels from Leopoldville to Haiti and in and around 1969 from Haiti to the United States. Honigsbaum and Quayman again draw on the work of Pepin for a plausible answer as to how. Congo's independence in 1960, marred by civil war, led to an influx of refugees into Kinshasa and an expansion of prostitution. Another outcome was the exodus of a Belgian expatriate skilled middle class. This vacuum of labour supply was addressed by campaigns to bring in skilled labour from elsewhere. Overseen by the World Health Organisation and UNESCO, recruits came from Haiti in the early 1960s. By the late 60s and early 1970s, however, the political instability of the state ideological campaign known as Zairization to rid the Democratic Republic of Congo of so-called um, vestiges of colonialism and Western influence. This drove many of this labour force back to Haiti. It would have taken just one of these returnees to have carried HIV with them. In January 1972, the New York Times broke a story, a story of the commodification and export of Haitian human blood plasma and a political economy evolving both US-based capital and the Haitian government. I'll leave you to read this quote independently for a few moments.
I'm reminded here in reading this quote from the story that the New York Times broke of a quote from Marx. Capital is dead labour, which vampire-like only lives by sucking living labour and lives the more, the more labour it sucks. Luckner Cambrone, because of his central exploitative role in the selling of blood plasma of Haitian donors to the United States, was widely coined both in Haiti and overseas, the vampire of the Caribbean. Via either one infected person or one infected container of blood plasma, around 1969, HIV travels from Haiti to the United States. From there, it later travels to Canada, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, the Netherlands, France, the United Kingdom, Germany, Estonia, South Korea, Japan, Thailand and Australia. It also travels back into Africa. Since the first cases of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome were officially reported in 1981 in the US, worldwide 76 million people have been infected with HIV and 33 million people have died. A popular narrative represented through um, Randy Schiltz and the band Played On, for example, um, either politically stigmatises or reclaims the association of HIV AIDS with queer sexuality, but this is only one part of a wider historical story, specifically how the virus amplified once it arrived in the United States. In the wider historical narrative that I have relayed, Capital is a leading actor. Marx observes in Grundrisse, Capital by its nature drives beyond every spatial barrier. Thus the creation of the physical conditions of exchange, of the means of communication and transport, the annihilation of space by time becomes an extraordinary necessity for it. From possibly just one human exposure in southeastern Cameroon, HIV AIDS made its way into and later out of Kinshasa through the new transportation routes of a colonial era and a globalising era. Because capital abides no geographical limits, former epidemiological dead ends were no more and new viral pathways were generated. I move now to a story on SARS. In the period since 1979, known as opening and reform, the Chinese Communist Party has overseen the entry of foreign capital into the country. Through the 1980s, especially the 1990s and into the, the early millennium, China experienced a staggering pace and degree of economic growth and urbanisation. Guangdong, a coastal province in southern China, has been at the centre of this rapid capitalist transformation. Home to three of the earliest special economic zones and to the Pearl River Delta economic zone, Guangdong is now the largest provincial economy and population in China. With Guangzhou, its capital, and Shenzhen, global megacities, and the country's top two earners vis-a-vis um, -vis GDP output. This has driven two ecological effects. The development of industrial-scale poultry farms to supply Guangdong's huge labour force, growing from an estimated 700 million chickens in 1997 to, by 2008, 1 billion so-called high-quality broiler chickens annually. Second ecological effect, the orientation of smaller livestock producers and rice farmers to fattening domestic chickens and ducks to sell on in the wet markets that exist on the edges of Guangdong's urban areas. Wet markets, by the way, are markets that, alongside fruit and vegetables, stock live animals for slaughter as fresh meat and fish. Davis explains, Thanks especially to the prevalence of wet markets in the cities, the urbanisation of Guangdong has probably intensified rather than decreased microbial traffic between humans and animals. As income has risen with industrial employment, the population is eating more meat and less rice and vegetables. An extraordinary concentration of poultry coexists with high human densities, large numbers of pigs and ubiquitous wild birds. 
Moreover, as the urban footprint has expanded and farm acreage has contracted, a fractal pattern of garden plots next to dormant trees and factories has brought urban population and livestock together in more intimate contact. Guangdong is also a huge market for wild meat. Quayman, referencing Carl Taro Greenfeld, observes that the wild animal trade within the Pearl River Delta is less to do with limited resources, need or ancient traditions and more attributable to the capitalist boom and related rise in conspicuous consumption. The contemporary era of wild flavour, as it's known, most prevalent in southern China, draws from earlier traditions and goes beyond them. Wild flavour is regarded as a way of gaining face, prosperity and good luck. To supply Guangdong's wet markets to meet the demand of a burgeoning affluent class frequenting the wild flavour restaurants of the province's cities, there has been an increase in the volume of wild animal trade, with greater cross-border commerce, both legal and illegal, from other Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam and Laos, for example, into southern China, and a rise in captive bred animals on unregulated small farms. This is what Mike Davis in 2005 coined the monster at our door. And in light of SARS coronavirus 2, states as the entirely familiar monster that has now walked through our front door. He elaborates, super urbanizing animal populations by factory farming is artificially creating the optimal conditions for the emergence of newly infectious diseases, speeding up the evolution of new strains and guaranteeing the advent of pandemics. Following the work of Rob Wallace, an article from the Chinese Cheng Journal argues that emergent infectious diseases arising in and out of China are best understood through a wider economic geography innate to capitalism, specifically the evolutionary pressure cooker of capitalist agriculture and urbanisation, which provides the ideal medium through which ever more devastating plagues are born, transformed, induced to zoonotic leaps, and then aggressively vectored through the human population. To this is added similarly intensive, intensive processes occurring at the economy's fringes, where wild strains are encountered by people, pushed to ever more extensive agroeconomic incursions into local ecosystems. The most recent coronavirus in its wild origins and its sudden spread through a heavily industrialised and urbanised core of the global economy represents both dimensions of our new era of political economic plagues. The exceptional coming together of multiple species, which would not have otherwise crossed paths in nature, yet are now stacked up together in crowded conditions in dense urban environments is, as Quayman puts it, zoological bedlam. It should be of no surprise then that a wet market in Guangzhou was the source of the zoonotic leap of SARS in 2002 and a wet market in Wuhan, Hubei province in south central China, the source of the spillover of SARS coronavirus 2 in 2019. The natural reservoirs of both SARS coronaviruses are likely bats. While SARS had a higher mortality rate, a critical difference between SARS and SARS coronavirus 2 is the latter's higher viral load prior to the onset of symptoms, which makes the effort to contain its spread much more difficult. I turn now to some conclusions. In narrating two stories about HIV AIDS and SARS, I want to warn against geographically limiting one's attention to Africa and Asia when thinking about pandemic threat. Instead, a focus on the intersection of the local and the global is key. Local conditions of existence and capitalist political economy shape viral evolution, thus have meaning in explaining and predicting emergent infectious diseases. But the local intimately intersects with global networks and processes of capitalist political economy. Eskew and Carlson note, due to globalisation, industrial agriculture and the ubiquity of viral 
biodiversity, a pandemic can emerge practically anywhere. For instance, the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, which originated from a pig farm in the United States. At the same time, influenza is also emergent as Wallace states, by way of a globalised network of corporate poultry production and trade, wherever specific strains first evolve. Furthermore, in the context of the biosecurity of a globalised agribusiness, in which, for example, mass vaccination of poultry is itself generating in reaction more evolutionary virulent strains of influenza, a myopic focus on Africa and Asia takes our attention away from the fact that richer countries routinely outsource their biodiversity threats to other nations. Or, as David Harvey remarks, capitalism never solves its crisis problems, it moves them around geographically. At all scales, states and capitals are involved in the covering up and downplaying of emergent infectious diseases because pathogens are, Wallace spells out, enmeshed within the political economy of the business of food. Moves by the World Health Organization to a new naming system uh, of um, newly emergent infectious diseases away from specifying geographic or animal origin is precisely because of the political pressure uh, by powerful states and industries. There's a conceptual error that can be found in much work exploring ecological crises, both on pandemics and on climate change. The Anthropocene, for example, effectively presents humanity as a single homogenous block outside of historical forms of society with distinct socio-economic relations, which, as Andreas Mann recognises, renaturalizes ecological crisis as an outcome of human disposition. Marxist ecology applies a crucial insight and steer to the relationship between human socio-economic relations and nature by understanding that capitalism produces the conditions that provoke an irreparable rift in the interdependent processes of social metabolism, a metabolism prescribed by the natural laws of life itself. The problem is capitalism. As such, the solution is a global system change that has at its centre a socialised humanity that governs the human metabolism with nature in a rational way, bringing it under our collective control instead of being dominated by it as a blind power. If we are to find ourselves out of a current trajectory of escalating pandemics, we need a socialist politics that is radical and visionary. I'll end uh, with a quote from Marx. The view of nature attained under the domination of private property and money is a real contempt for and practical debasement of nature. It is in this sense that Thomas Munzer declares it intolerable that all creatures have been turned into property. The fishes in the water, the birds in the air, the plants on the earth, the creatures too must become free. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, this slide lists the references that I've used in this talk. There is also available on my blog, Anemic on a Bike, a full transcript of my presentation here today. Okay, thank you very much for listening.